Morning, everyone. Uh, just some quick announcements. Uh, also, we're so excited. Um, Dr. Allison DeForest will be uh, leading our service and presiding and preaching for us this Sunday. Uh, and then also, uh, congrats, uh, he is not here, but uh, Pastor Dennis Ritter, uh, him and his wife, their uh, daughter just had a daughter. So uh, we're very happy about that. It was a very healthy pregnancy, and uh, we're really happy for them. So that's where uh, Pastor Ritter is currently. Um, just some other updates. Uh, our annual worship at uh, and picnic will be at Bowers Park this year, um, which we normally do, and that will be Sunday, August 27th. And that will start at 10 a.m. So go to Bowers Park on August 27th, because we will not be here. And we're starting at 10 a.m., and then there will be a picnic after. If you'd like to bring a uh, dish, uh, we have sign-ups on the office door uh, down front. Uh, also, Oh, the, also we have an organ concert coming up. Uh, we're very excited about that. That will also be September, that'll be on Sunday, September 24th. So you have a little bit of time to plan, but mark your calendars for that. That will be at 3 p.m. with a man named uh, Rudy Lacente. Did I pronounce that right? Yes, you did. Um, so he'll be coming and playing the organ for us. We're very excited about that. So that will be September 27th. Uh, so, or summer, I'm sorry, September 24th at 3 p.m. And then lastly, uh, no youth groups this Sunday, but youth groups will pick back up next Sunday and it'll be held here at Trinity. Yes, Dan. Any other questions, or I mean, not questions, any other announcements? All right, if not, uh, please prepare our hearts for worship as we hear our prelude. The prelude this morning is Eternal Father, Strong to Save. Please rise as you're able. <clears throat> God speaks to the faithful, to those who turn to God in their hearts. Where God dwells, steadfast love and faithfulness meet, righteousness and peace kiss each other. Down from 
the sky. God gives what is good, and we respond with abundant praise. The psalmist tells us that when we turn to God in our hearts, God speaks peace to the faithful. As we turn to God in true confession of our sin, we trust in God whose shalom makes us whole. Gracious God, you call us to step out in faith, trusting in you for all things. We respond to your command, but then sink in doubt and fear. We hide from the challenges of bold discipleship. We are not able to fulfill your commandments for our purposes and in our hearts or act of we pray when we confess with our lips, but do not believe in our hearts or act upon our confession. Help us to practice our faith in all circumstances. Lift us out of sin into the arms of your mercy. Though we are distracted by noise all around, allow us to hear your voice even when it is the sound of sheer silence. We pray in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Jesus is Lord. God raised him from the dead, and we are saved through him. This is the good news. We believe in our hearts and confess with our mouth. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. This is good news to share with all people. grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all.
Let us pray. Holy God, you speak to us in a voice unexpected and come to us in ways we do not recognize. Never leaving us to our own devices or defenses, you are the ever-present, all-powerful God. Call us out in faith again and again until we learn to walk with you in steadfast love and faithfulness and in peace. In the name of him who comes to us upon the waters, Jesus the Christ. Amen. Amen. A reading from 1 Kings chapter 19. At Horeb, the mount of God, Elijah came to a cave and spent the night there. Then the word of the Lord came to him, saying, What are you doing here, Elijah? And he answered, I have been very zealous for the Lord, the God of hosts. For the Israelites have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. I alone am left, and they are seeking my life to take it away. He said, Go out and stand on the mountains before the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. Now there was a great wind so strong that it was splitting mountains and breaking rocks into pieces before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind, and after the wind, an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake, and after the earthquake, a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire, and after the fire, a sound of sheer silence. When came a voice to him that said, What are you doing here, Elijah? He answered, I have been very zealous for your prophets with the sword. I have been very zealous to the Lord, the God of hosts, for the Israelites have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, and killed the Lord and said to him, Go return on your way to the wilderness of Damascus. When you arrive, and you shall anoint Aziel as king over Aram. Also you shall anoint Jehu, son of Nashim, as king of Brazil. And you shall anoint Elisha, son of Yashban, and abel Mihail as prophet in your place. Whoever escapes from the sword of Aziel, Jehu shall kill. And whoever escapes from the sword of Jehu, Elisha shall kill. Yet I will leave 7,000 in Israel, all the knees that have been not bowed, but to bow. And every mouth has that, that has not kissed him. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. A reading from Romans chapter 10. Moses writes concerning the righteousness that comes from the law, that the person who does these things will live by them. But the righteousness that comes from faith says, do not say in your heart, who will ascend into heaven? that is, to bring Christ down, or who will descend into the abyss, that is, to bring Christ up from the dead. But what does it say? The word is near you, on your lips and in your heart, that is, the word of faith that we proclaim. Because if you confess with your lips that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For one believes with the heart, and so is justified in the heart, and God has raised him from the dead. He will be saved. For one believes with the heart, and so is justified, and one confesses with the mouth, and so is saved. The scripture says, no one who believes in him will be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. The same Lord is Lord of all, and is generous to all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. But how are they to call on one in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in one in whom they have not heard? And how are they to hear without someone to proclaim him? And how are they to proclaim him unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. Word of God, word of life.
The Holy Gospel according to Matthew, the 14th chapter. Glory to you, o Lord. Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, while he dismissed the crowds. And after he had dismissed the crowds, he went up the mountain by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone. But by this time, the boat, battered by the waves, was far from the land, for the wind was against them. And early in the morning, Jesus came walking toward them on the sea. But when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified, saying, it is a ghost. And they cried out in fear. But immediately, Jesus spoke to them and said, take heart, it is I, do not be afraid. Peter answered him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come out to you on the water. He said, come. So Peter got out of the boat, started walking on the water, and came toward Jesus. But when he noticed the strong wind, he became frightened and began to sink. He cried out, Lord, save me. Jesus immediately reached out his hand and caught him, saying to him, you of little faith, why did you doubt? When they got into the boat, the wind ceased, and those in the boat worshiped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God, the Gospel of the Lord. Praise you, Christ. You may be seated. So, hearing that story of Peter coming out of the boat, I always wonder, you know, like, what was this first step like? You know, like, that would be really scary, that first step out of the boat, having to lie, like, put your leg over and then and stepping out. That's a very scary thing to take a step, or like, sometimes we call it like a leap of faith or a step of faith. And I was just thinking, I noticed this really cool thing. You know, Jesus is, or Peter's whole thing was he was supposed to keep his eyes on Jesus. Because when he started looking at his feet sinking and like saw the waves and stuff, it said that's when he got really scared. And something cool about our church and a lot of churches like this, if you notice in our, our aisle here, if you're walking down the aisle and you're looking straight ahead, what is the thing you're looking at? The cross. And I always say the great thing about liturgical churches, is I always see everything has some kind of meaning. So when our acolytes uh, will come up, they're looking at the cross. Sometimes uh, some churches will bring uh, process and they'll bring up stuff, uh, but the cross is always up front and we always are kind of keeping our eyes on the cross. And it's a good way to remind us, even in this church building, that when we are coming in or when we are going back into the world, our eyes are supposed to be kind of focused on Jesus. Because like Peter, at any point when we're scared, we can say, Jesus, save me. And we can keep our eyes and kind of look to Jesus, even when it feels like we're kind of like on scary water or we have to make that really scary first big step, uh, especially when we're going back to school in a couple weeks or starting a new job or any of those kind of things. Um, so I'm going to say a quick prayer for us. Dear God, help us uh, to have faith in you and help us to be brave enough to say, Jesus, save me, uh, when sometimes when we feel scared or afraid. Uh, thank you for things in this building that can remind us um, to keep our eyes focused on you. Amen. So I think, like Seth was kind of just saying, both our stories this morning from 1 Kings and Matthew are really intense passages. And this time around, they are more personal to me than I think they have ever been before. So this summer started off fresh and promising. I became the Craft Assistant Professor of Biblical Studies in New Testament, reaching for me an lo important long-term goal. But now, the summer has really become a pressure cooker. I'm currently teaching summer Greek as a two-week intensive course, emphasizing using Bible software, a way of teaching Greek that is new to me. 
I have three upcoming fall courses and new responsibilities as the faculty secretary, and I've not yet handed over my old responsibilities of director of institutional assessment and director of the graduate school. On top of this, Chris's two week bout with COVID and all the ways that it disrupted our household and the death of my sister just under two weeks ago now. And thank you all very much for all your prayers around both of these things. Every day I open up my email inbox and find something that has slipped through the cracks, another thing that I have failed to do. In the next two weeks, I need to travel to Oregon to officiate my nephew's wedding, my sister's son's wedding, and, and then finish teaching Greek, fly to New Mexico to lead his mother's funeral, begin those three fall semester classes. Do I sound like Elijah yet? <laughs> I search in my mind and I can't think of anything I did wrong and yet here I am stretched so thin that I can hardly breathe. I feel like Jesus. Is it bad to say that? I'm looking for a moment of silence to get away to pray and I find that instead there are 5,000 plus tasks in front of me, each as important as the next. But enough about me, back to our stories. First, we have Elijah in his famous, famous Moses in the cave at Mount Horeb. Prior to this, Elijah has been instrumental in demonstrating God's power in a contest with the prophets of Baal, the Canaanite Phoenician god whom Queen Jezebel, wife of Ahab, who is the king of Israel, worships. That contest ended with the prophets of Baal being destroyed, and Jezebel is not happy about that. And so Elijah, coming fresh off that victory, is fleeing for his life. If we read the whole story, we would see that God cares for Elijah as he runs away, and now as he comes to the holy mountain, Horeb. What is Elijah looking for? God asks him that exact same question, and we hear Elijah vent a little, or maybe a lot. He says it all twice. And then God demonstrates God's presence in an unexpected way, that sheer silence, or we're used to hearing the still small voice. And then God sends Elijah right back out there with his marching orders. Our gospel story of Jesus walking on the sea is a direct continuation of the story of the feeding of the 5,000 men plus women and children that you all heard last week in church, and I'm sure that Pastor Miller has had great things to share with you on that story. But I want to highlight again how it begins. Jesus had just heard that John the Baptist was brutally and rather capriciously executed. And so Jesus retires to a deserted place. We don't know exactly what he was looking for when he did this. Was he grieving? Well, maybe. But Matthew doesn't include any details about Jesus' relationship with John. Was he afraid? Well, maybe. But Jesus doesn't seem afraid very often. Was he demonstrating that God's response to injustice is not violent confrontation? Hmm. In any case, we are left to wonder. But Jesus' quest to be alone is not yet successful, right? He gets there, and a large crowd has gotten there before him. And so instead of going on further or turning away or hiding, he, along with his deputized disciples, take care of their needs. And now in today's part of the stories, the crowds have been fed. Jesus sends his disciples on ahead of him and then takes the time to send the crowds back home and finally finds that time alone to pray. And while he is praying, the disciples, now far from shore, are encountering rough seas. And I love how the Greek puts it. The waves are torturing the boat. Getting on towards morning, then, Jesus comes walking across the sea to meet them. Remember, these are fishermen. They are used to the boats and the Sea of Galilee. Jesus sending them on ahead does not endanger them, and they are not afraid of the weather in this story, though it makes them work hard because the wind is against them. What makes them troubled and afraid is seeing a man walking across the water towards them. I think that would make me afraid too. They do not understand what is happening. They think he's a ghost, 
a phantasm. But notice what Matthew tells us. They cry out, in, when they cry out in fear, immediately Jesus speaks to them, reassuring them, letting them know that it is he. Ego eimi, he says in the Greek, I am. And that is the name that God gave to Moses at the burning bush. Peter seems to need more than this. If it is you, Lord, command me to come out to you on the water. What is Peter looking for? Is he feeling like Elijah? Is he thinking, boy, we've been following you for a while now. You've been stretching us really thin, sending us out two by two, getting us into all sorts of trouble as you get into trouble with the leaders of our people, daring us to feed 5,000 people with five loaves and two fish, and then just sending us away into the storm. Does Peter think he needs something more? In any case, Jesus does what Peter requests. At Jesus' command, Peter gets out of the boat and begins to walk on the water. But then doubt takes over and he sinks. And again, immediately, Jesus reaches out his hand and rescues him. And when they get back into the boat, the wind ceases. So how about you? I am very sure that I am not the only one in this room that has, or on Zoom, that has felt the way I feel. I imagine that most of you have, at some point in your life, felt that your situation was impossible. And some of you might feel that way right now. What is God saying to us through this familiar story of Jesus walking on the water and Peter's bold but futile attempt to be like him? First. I call to mind that God knows God's people well and knows their capabilities. God sends Elijah because God knows that Elijah can do what needs to be done. And God actively supports Elijah as he works, as he flees, as he rests, and as he goes back out there. And Jesus knows his disciples. He's been teaching them and training them. He never asks them to do something they cannot do. Second, I remember that word immediately. The minute the disciples show signs of fear or despair, Jesus calls out or reaches out to reassure them. And let's think about the things he is showing them. In feeding the 5,000 men plus women and children, he shows them the abundance of God, that God desires all to have their needs met. In walking on the water and calming the sea, he shows them that he is God, that he does what God does. The disciples may, in those moments, have recalled Job 9.8, describing God who alone stretched out the heavens and trampled the waves of the sea. Or Psalm 89.9, you rule the raging of the sea. When its waves rise, you still them. And the disciples get it. At the end of our story, they worship and confess, truly, you are the Son of God. Finally, I think this story, both the feeding of the 5,000 plus and Jesus' coming to the disciples across the sea, show God's love. Jesus has compassion on the crowds, giving them food, taking time to send them home. Jesus responds immediately to the fear and despair of Peter and the other disciples. Along those same lines, I think that if we take the story seriously, we will find that this is a judgment-free zone. When Jesus rescues Peter, the Greek tells us maybe not that he, says, that he says you of little faith, but more that he calls him little faith. I hear this as a term of endearment, a gentle reminder that given what Peter has seen and done, he could have walked on the water as he asked, they all could have walked on the water. They all could have gotten out on that of that boat and partied on the sea. It is a reminder for the future, then, that God is always giving us what we need to do what God is calling us to do. So cry out if you need to cry out and see that God will immediately provide you with the help you need. 
maybe by revealing a way forward, maybe by giving you the peace and steadiness you need to do what you need to do, maybe by providing the help you need from someone else, maybe by making a way out of no way. And if it seems to you like no help is coming, if it feels like the dark night of the soul, then let go of yourself and trust that God is holding you even when you cannot feel it, knowing that soon God might just lovingly call you little faith, reminding you that, God call, that anything that God calls you to do can be done. Amen. Living together in trust and hope, we confess our faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and buried. He descended into death. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life of the last. Confident that God receives our joys and concerns, let us offer our prayers for the church, for those in need, and for all of creation. God of grace and faith, your faithfulness is never ending, and your righteousness becomes ours through Christ Jesus. Send the church to proclaim the gospel both near and far, in church buildings and on street corners, in person and through digital means. Raise up among your people those who seek to serve the church as deacons and pastors. We thank you for Seth and Chris who have begun their respective journeys towards ordination. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. God of earth, sky, and sea, the plants, animals, sea creatures, creatures, inhabitants of the air, mountains and plains, proclaim your glory. Prosper the 
the work of ecologists as they teach us new ways to care for the environment, bring relief to areas recovering from natural disasters. We pray for Hawaii and everyone affected by the fires, especially those who mourn the loss of dear ones. Hear us, O God. God of peace and justice, you call us to live as your beloved community throughout the world, instill in local, regional, national, and global leaders a desire to work for the well-being of all people. Help us to amplify or speak on behalf of those whose voices often are ignored in the halls of government, especially in Harrisburg and Washington, D.C. Hear us, O oh God. God of care and compassion, you bring assurance when we are afraid. Bring calm to any who are anxious or fearful. Bless the work of the therapists, nurses, and other health care providers. Comfort all who grieve and soothe anyone who are sick or injured, especially Kathy, Sherwood, Gail, Deb, Beatty, Bo, Ruth, Carl, Suzanne, Brian and Jennifer, Joanne, Ron, Sony, Jennifer, Becca, Laura, Steve, Holden, Karen, David, Warren, Wendy, Kaya, Dennis, Cindy, Russell, Linda, Joyce, and Jeff, all who have been impacted by gun violence or other violent crimes, the residents and former residents of the Kutztown Mobile Park who are being unjustly treated by the owners of the park. Your mercy, God in your mercy. God of wonder, you, you accompany us in both joys and sorrows. We pray for students, teachers, professors, and administrators preparing for a new academic year. Make your presence known in our work and play, in lively conversation and in quiet rest. Hear us, O oh God. God of joy, we pray for those who have reason to celebrate in these days on the occasion of their birthdays, especially Libby Rohrbach, Keegan Kramer, Jessica Miller, Suzanne Barron, Seth Noggle, Sarah Snyder, Jenny Toussaint, Fred Collier, Bill Collier, Jerome Lutz, Louise Schlegel, Marissa Steinmetz, and Larry Yost. Hear us, O God. God of new life, you send people to renew both church and society. We give you thanks for the lives of faithful, of their faithful service, especially nursing pioneers Florence Nightingale and Clara Mass, whom the church remembers today as examples of faithful service Hear us, O oh God. Into your hands, O oh God, we commend all for whom we pray. In the name of the one who reconciled all creation to himself, Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Amen. And the peace of Christ be with you always. And also with you. Please share signs of that peace with one another. Thanks, everyone.
Congratulations, Pastor.
Let us pray. God of field and forest, sea and sky, you are the giver of all good things. Sustain us with these gifts of your creation and multiply your graciousness in us that the world may be fed with your love through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, through our Savior Jesus Christ, who on this day overcame death and the grave and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting, as everlasting life. And so with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join in their unending hymn. Holy, holy. our Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, let us pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. And so for those of you who are on Zoom with us or who chose to get the individual cup, take your bread the body of Christ given for you. The rest of you may be seated. And now take your wine or grape juice, the blood of Christ shed for you. And now so those of you present with us here, you can come forward. Um, I will have bread, Joe will have the wine, and, and then there's grape juice too. So let's go.
And now may the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. We thank you, generous God, for the refreshment we have received at your banquet table. Send us now to spread your generosity into all the world through the one who is our dearest treasure, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Amen. And receive the blessing. The God who calls across the cosmos and speaks in the smallest seed, bless, keep you, and sustain you now and to the end of the age. Amen. Peace, share the harvest.